आज की ताजा खबर बेंगलुरु में रहने वाले लू और अमेरिका में रहने वाले सेठ आपसे कुछ बात करना चाहते हैं संगीतकार राजेश के साथ आपका स्वागत है लू सिटी What's going on people? I'm Lou and I'm Sid and we are Lucid. So, Sid, uh, we have a guest today and yes. uh, I want you to be uh, taking care of this session because you're the person who knows this guest. So go on. <laughs> so yeah, hello everyone. I think uh, most of us are glued to our phones in our daily lives like I was just checking my uh, average uh, daily screen time and it's like 4 hours every day. and like half of it is on social media that's true but the other half is still on like our you know our personal tasks like say banking uh food delivery grocery delivery etc and like the main reason is this because like mobile technology has obviously improved but the apps are so simple to use it's just not me who's using it it's my mom it's my grandmom everyone's just using it and like the main uh part that's been introduced in the process of application development is design you know like companies are focusing on design currently they, uh, they're putting a lot of emphasis on design they're building design teams and if you look at the indian space right now certain people have taken up the roles of spreading design education to get more people into the field of design and today's guest is abhinav chikara who's the founder of Desi- uh, 10k designers who spreads design education to help people understand design better uh, uh, which ultimately provides us delightful apps that we can use so hi abhinav how are you today hello lu and hello said very happy to be here um, i was just as you said screen time i just quickly looked at my screen time as well and mine's like 7 hours it's like way more uh but yeah <laughs> super happy to be here very excited about our conversation as well Yes. So uh to give our audience a bit of uh context Abhinav's an MIT grad not Massachusetts Manipal Institute of Technology and uh you know he's been in different startups he, as a designer he was a designer at housing.com he's he was the head of design at an academy and after working there for a couple of years i think like around two and a half years he said i wanted to spread design education to people and he started 10k designers so i mean now let's start from there so you're the head of design at an academy like you know it was a thriving startup is growing very fast so how was your situation then and what was your thought process of leaving an academy a great startup to start your own uh, design education cohort based yeah. course um the thing was an academy was was growing really well um i was was having like a lot of fun and uh, it was definitely challenging and um useful at the same time which is over those 2 years we were able to build almost everything that an academy still uses today which is on the learner side on the educator side all the tools all the um learning different modules different tests tests and all of that stuff so a, literally a complete redesign building the team and all of that stuff But for me personally I never really personally saw myself as somebody who would just do a job um and not really because there's something wrong with that it's just for me I enjoy setting things up from scratch right so when I joined on academy it was that was like the main thing that needed to be done very very desperately but then by the time I left it was a much more stable organization right like I remember I was employee number like 40 something and by the end of it there were I think close to a thousand employees, right? So very mature organization, um, and the kind of design leader needed was somebody who was literally focused on the experience beyond that. So not a lot of zero to one stuff, and that was something that I enjoyed the most. I think that is also a space which where there's a lot of chaos because you're literally fighting against um, gravity or inertia or whatever. to go from 0 to 1 right it's the first stuff so that's the kind of chaotic environment i enjoy yeah. so that's why i decided okay it it was a very difficult decision for me but i decided to do 10k designers and it wasn't really 10k designers as in the thing that you see today that i had planned 
but it was more around okay i know that in the past whenever i've taken a break from uh, whatever i was doing i was able to figure something out through side projects some of those side projects maybe worked uh, so that was the goal but uh, eventually you know with my youtube that had been going on as well with a small community that i had been building this sort of looked like the natural step so that's how i got into it and design is something that i really enjoy like design for me was kind of like a life boat back in college which is i was like oh, like out of all the feelings of being stuck that i felt in college uh, mostly because you know i wasn't enjoying the academic side of things gpa everything suffering design was one thing where i was like you know i enjoy it i'm challenged by it and i still see that there's just so much more that i have to catch up on um so that f- has stayed with me right. even today right. and so to build something long term around that kind of passion was felt very natural to me yeah right that's awesome uh, i think awesome. you mentioned one interesting thing about chaos <laughs> right and like you know me currently i'm doing a masters in business and lou is also doing an mba i think one thing that all our professors say is like you know you have to deal uh, a deal in ambiguity you have to enjoy yeah. chaos right so you know could you uh, uh, you know talk to us about like some of the experiences of like this chaos say in an academy or your different projects mm. i think it's just the way i kind of look at chaos is the status quo the gap between the status quo and where we want to be is so mm-hmm. huge right such that the defaults are just set right. against you right versus i kind of feel like a less chaotic environment is one where the status quo is actually good enough actually really really good and now the main job is pushing a few basis points every single day right uh, that's maybe a more scalable organize at least my right. view of it so for me i think an academy the biggest uh, challenge that we had was when i joined it was not it was although the number of employees was small it was not a small startup by any chance right like um, i think it was probably series a at that point Monet, there was no monetization but it had a lot of users it was already one of the biggest education channels on youtube so the challenge was the app that we had at that point was very basic did not work it was it was basically the equivalent of having having just a folder structure and that was the app right it's a folder structure where you click this and say geography go inside mm-hmm. geography this, this thing and after seven clicks you're like okay here's right. the video right uh, very basic so the challenge was creating something that firstly accommodates all this stuff that we already have and then our users are also already using this in some way so making it such that they don't stop using it and then also there is a future vision where there is a lot of other things we want to do so ideally we want this version of the app that we're doing now to also have space for that future stuff um and and then of course the yeah. other challenge is not just one app it's two apps because you have the learners which are actually using this for their prep but you have educators who are literally using this for their livelihood which is they're using this to create content they've got analytics they want to see you know did my last session hit as i expected it to what do i need to change what's everybody else doing so that was the biggest challenge going from almost you know nothing to now creating this entire system and luckily you know i didn't have to do that alone the founders were very aligned that that is what we had to do that we had to build a product driven company right so i really enjoyed my time with the founders and i think the engineering team the design team we built um not so many product managers at that initial stage but eventually the product um division as well like that sort of became our challenge yeah you're right so yeah. you had you had youtube going for you as you were in this journey through an academy as well right yeah. and um you were you were kind of doing videos on uh, you know certain uh, obviously mm-hmm. design and also i think there were these how how a person should probably thinking be thinking about their own careers or like you know how a person should probably be learning and stuff what made you kind of move from uh, just the youtube space that you were kind of working with to a cohort based kind of curriculum that you are now working on with uh, 10k mm-hmm. designers and yeah first of all i guess you can define what yeah. cbcs are and then you can take forward yeah. yeah so my intention was not really to you know 
I wasn't going into this saying, let's monetize YouTube or let's start a CBC. I would have loved if I could have figured out a different way of monetization. But essentially, I knew I had to work with what I had available right now. And that was the limited amount of YouTube. I think I was a couple thousand subscribers at back then. Um, I had the community, which was, you know, a couple hundred people in a WhatsApp group, which eventually became Telegram and then eventually Discord. So I had these things and I had a you know, little bit on Twitter that going on. People kind of knew what was, uh, what I was working on. So for me, it was about, mm -hmm. okay, now that I have this, what makes sense for me to do? And uh, somehow it ended up being, I did try a couple different things. Monetization wasn't really straightforward, didn't really work. But the main feedback that I got from the group was that we need a way to learn design. And this was not just from the group, but also on YouTube. As somebody who's starting out, I was creating those videos. In my mind, I was like, okay, I've made this. Now that you have this, go make the app, right? It's done. Like I just taught you, you now see this and now go do it. But there were a lot of places where people get stuck. Or even if they do it, they're like, okay, now what's next? Or just the magnetism of design wasn't strong enough such that they would do mm. it, but then it would fizzle out within a few days or within a few weeks or something else in their life kind of um, takes back their attention and time from them. So I saw that, you know, people, it's not that people weren't interested, not like they did not want to do it. It's just that YouTube videos did not work for them. Like it was okay to a certain extent, but I think what people expected and the kind of, let me just say the kind of transformation people wanted to make, YouTube seemed like a very, very slow way of doing it, very, very passive way of doing it. And people mm -hmm. were like, dude, let's do more. So we started doing more in the Discord. We started doing these kind of weekly challenges and that kind of stuff. And people enjoyed it. People had a lot more outcome. Because suddenly, I, th I also feel like with YouTube, the person on the other side who's watching this, they are kind of, they kind of feel invisible at times. They're like, whether I do it or not, this other, per the person who's teaching me is not going to know. Versus when you're in a community, you're like, dude, shit, like, yeah. what am I going to say when they ask me, why haven't you done it? Or when everybody else is doing it and they are talking about it and I am quiet, I'm going to feel weird because they expect me to say something. Right. So those kind of accountability dynamics started kicking in and I was like, okay, let's just go all in. Let's say we're, so the first cohort, so to say, I was just like, let's make it a paid thing because I really do want your commitment to this. Right? Because even then accountability was still a problem. Like you would drop off, you would have work, you would have college. So I said, okay, you're going to pay. This is going to be accountability. We're going to have a small group of people, um, not too small, but big enough that you have different people to learn with. Um, and we're going to go through this entire program mm -hmm. three months together. And we'll try to create some kind of path around this. And then that sort of, I realized was maybe there was a wave as, as well of CBCs, which is cohort based courses which is the whole idea is, you know, it's not just me who's been feeling this kind of gap between teaching, but it's a general gap that people are feeling in the market. And uh, a live course where you're meeting somebody online um, literally wasn't possible a couple of years ago because Zoom wasn't as prevalent, right? We used to use Skype and it was like a max of five people in a room. Now suddenly anybody can do broadcast. So it was just like kind of natural timing and, uh, like literally with the available tools, you were able to create a really good learning experience that um, had a lot of engagement. People were sticky. They could, you know, actually do it through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. So I think it kind of comes from a need or a hunger of, for people to kind of mix the traditional ways of learning along with these modern technologies like YouTube and stuff and kind of that kind of beautifully coalesced into CBCs. Yeah. Now, my question is, was this effective? Did you see effective transformation in hmm. people when you did this? Absolutely. And I can tell you, going into it, I actually pretty much knew it was going to work. Um, and the main reason for this was I had just mm -hmm. done something similar at Unacademy. Right? And I had all of that okay. in my uh, mind. I was like, I was like, if it can work for that, there's no reason why it can't work for design especially at the numbers, like the numbers I was doing were 
amateur hours compared to the numbers on Acad- the numbers the product I had built the product we had built at on academy was doing right that was thousands like each live class had a couple of hundred people um and over there it was working in a lot of different contexts like jee um state exams smaller exams bank exams right it, it was a general tool that worked so for me i was like i know that if i hadn't done on academy i would be very skeptical i would be like you know is that really possible um will people really this thing but having done that i was like this is fairly certain and i knew it would take time to really see these results so what i actually did was i actually ran cohort 1 mm-hmm. and 2 back to back like no break um and then in those 6 okay. months i was able to see okay the people in the first cohort had started getting jobs they had you know they were having success at um applying what they had learned maybe the case studies the learnings in personal projects freelance as well as startups so those 6 months gave me that validation and then we did and then we started saying okay let's do bigger cohorts and let's start actually getting some of these people who've been successful let's start getting them on board as mentors because they've just been through the program they would probably be able to help a lot better mm-hmm. um and since i was at an academy you know at another startup housing before that i knew a lot of or let's just say some designers in the industry and i was just like hey can you just do me a favor join as an industry mentor you know i'll pay you as well and then so we were able to somehow just glue this together these different pieces um absolutely no code this is different because at an academy had a full engineering team where we could just build whatever we wanted here i was just like taking these lego right. pieces together uh, but yeah that's what it was <laughs> right uh, one question i have is like as you said cbcs or cohort based courses are these live classes with you as an instructor and you have people and you're teaching them mm-hmm. on zoom uh, what additional differences are there like in a cbc compared to like say a traditional uh, design school or even a normal engineering college yeah. like what what are like some of the main differences hmm. so we can compare it to online and then we can compare it to offline right with online right. the main difference is that it's a way more interactive and you kind of get to see the other person like for example if i were to make videos on youtube or let's say a course on udemy or if i'm a professor and i make something on coursera i will never see the faces of the people who are actually uh, taking the course right and i'll never like as i'm right. teaching as i'm saying something i don't get that real time feedback of seeing their face become confused or you know like like nodding in agreement mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. kind of thing but then in a normal offline environment that's like pretty much the default right you are in the classroom and you can see this stuff happening so i think cbcs are very interesting because they're trying to bridge kind of like the best of what's of both sides which is offline of course doesn't let you go to scale very easily like you would really have to get an auditorium if you want to get a lot more people or you know you'd have to really convince people You're to limited by geography Yeah, you have to convince people to you know move from whatever wherever they are to your college town and you know that's not feasible. Um so that's sort of what it was that makes sense uh, bridging bo- both of those things and it's mostly live instruction which is of course normal in offline but it was somehow not normal in online because we so far the technology there was no way to scale it up. Like pre-recorded was still the best way to scale up and now with live and with Zoom and covid also accelerated you know people's acceptance to use zoom multiple times a day um i think that's what it was about right and i think one more challenge that i'd see like as you said like in terms of accountability you asked your mm-hmm. uh, you know students to pay so that they have that commitment but say like an udemy course or a coursera course is either free or, you know by their college mm-hmm. or even if they are not like say a course is like 500 rupees or 1000 rupees right and like here since you're putting in all this all this effort the price is much higher so like how did you tackle that situation mm. i'm really curious about that yeah this is a great question very good question i think it's definitely um a bit of a tricky thing to 
say that a course like this is going to cost you a thousand dollars when maybe you expect to pay mm-hmm. you know you demi 90 percent off free with your student account like when that's kind of the default in your mind right or youtube which is free um the advantage that i kind of had was i was able to um convince a small enough group of people to pay for it and then a slightly bigger mm-hmm. and then with those results a lot more people to pay for it so i was able to sort of carve that out um but i think there is a certain type of person who is serious about learning who is willing to pay that like coming back to online versus offline people pay a lot more for offline right like like your right. semester a, a single semester is probably 10000 15 20000 tuition fees right you can tell me from way off um, i i actually right. don't know what the values are right now <laughs> well, i mean dollars is quite way off yeah. i mean <laughs> but uh, i guess you can say that in terms of you know if you take parity into mm-hmm. consideration so yeah. yeah and like myself like when i was in manipal my fees was about 2 lakhs a year right which goes up i think it's probably close right. to 5 mm-hmm. now from what i've heard so of yeah. course i can't say the same thing yes. i i could not definitely use these things and say that oh you should pay me because you're paying in college uh, but i think there was a general type of person who is very se- who's serious enough about um wanting it who who is serious enough that they they were like you know i have actually tried all of this other stuff i absolutely understand when you say that youtube doesn't work mm-hmm. or or you it works amazingly right i used it too but it has its limitations and so they were willing to kind of pay that price and i think another way i kind of saw that was on youtube you get all this for free but what you're paying for is with your attention right like on the sidebar you now have right. all of these like you have music videos you have your other subscriptions you have you know mm-hmm. um the latest vlog by the youtuber that you follow which is good because youtube was made for entertainment that is its purpose but um it really saps your energy like like by small cuts so i think even right. today i don't really try to convince people that hey you should pay it and these are the advantages i think it takes a certain person who wants who wants it bad enough such that they are like you know it is a pain I have tried all of this stuff and now I'm willing to make that commitment. Um yeah. Yeah. I I think it's interesting you said that like you know certain type of people because I'm also a student of uh, 10k yeah, designers yeah. cohort 4 and uh, like from my experience like you know I came across your YouTube channel randomly because like, I just quit my job and I was randomly going through YouTube. I came th- uh, you know came across your playlist mm-hmm. of uh, you know introduction to design and like you mentioned this part like you know design can be done by anyone like especially like app design and web design you don't have to uh, have the talent of being creative and that's what stuck with mm-hmm. me and like as you said right like i think like one really good thing that you've done about yourself is like you sold yourself really well in on social media like say twitter and youtube through your videos yeah. and that stuck with mm-hmm. me and one more thing is as you said is the alumni like one of my juniors like vaishnav he is from yeah, rv yeah. so uh, i spoke to him and like the amount of uh, you know the recommendation he gave that see you want to be a product manager so like you need to understand design so this will be a really good thing mm. so i think all this culminated together is getting like the hype that 10k designers uh, is getting all the students from mm. yeah man right and i think um, it's a great point i mean about scaling uh, that you kind of brought up on how you know online can allow you to really uh make this kind of participation take place and like what sid was mentioning he had a rv junior who kind mm-hmm. of like really recommended this as well so now my question is how are you planning on scaling this further um what is kind of working for you right now in 10k designers what are the gaps and where do you think this yeah. is going to head in the future i mean i i have a big problem with scale um not that i don't like scale but uh, it's very difficult <laughs> so it's a, it's a challenge that i still haven't solved um i think the thing that's that we have going for us is just all this positive momentum which is 
I we have mm. slowly been increasing cohort size. Like one very counterintuitive fact was like the first two cohorts were around 30 or 40 people each. Right? The cohorts after that were 100 something each. Now people would expect that a 30 person okay. cohort is way more engaging. I get more um maybe one on one time and it's cozy versus right. 150 people and I'm like, you know, oh is this but what we found was people had way more fun with the 150 um around the 150 size they met a lot more people and although the number of people was huge i think it's just natural for humans to start creating subgroups as soon as they're in right. any network whether that's you join a new office you you know move somewhere you go to a college like subgroups automatically form so what we did was we just incentivized this a little bit by creating these city groups, uh, by creating kind of small interest mm -hmm. groups, you know, like we also had, like, like you mentioned with RV, we've got a lot of people from RV. We've got people from VIT, from Manipal. Those people automatically just start talking to each other. So we actually found that 150 right. was a way better experience. And that was not something I expected. That's something people who are joining now, are still hesitant about they're like you know that's a huge size i don't know if um that's gonna be good but luckily we have the technology for that like even with zoom every session you can be i mean you've been through that so breakout we can create breakout rooms where you can yeah. say we're gonna actually have groups of five people and we're gonna do this um, in discord you have these voice channels people go to dms people create group chats they go to whatsapp uh, so we have that going for us but then i think and another thing with the positive momentum is people are now at these startups. So they, when they need to hire, of course, they don't just say, let's go to 10 K. Like that would be kind of biased. They try everywhere, but it's very likely that the people from 10 K designers, they've actually mentored them as an alumni mentor or an industry mentor, or just, they've had more visibility. Mm -hmm. So they know that, you know, Rather than you're just an applicant who's just submitted an application for our job. It's like you're this person who I've sort of been seeing here and there on Twitter, right. on Zoom over the past six months. So I am just like, I kind of know your strengths a little bit, even though I might have never, you know, formally interviewed you. So that's a very interesting kind of side effect. So I think all that positive momentum, now people are at amazing startups, right? So we've got like... Companies like Razorpay, Topper, Small Case, Flipkart, PhonePay. We've got people at these bigger companies as well as a lot of the um, more recent batch of startups, right? Like the ones who are, you know, a lot of them from YC, a lot of them who are, you know, have raised in right. the last couple of years. So I think that alumni, all that positive momentum, the fact that a lot of them are really, really want to return in the future cohorts because they had fun in theirs, mm -hmm. but then also they want to now be in a new role, which is that of an alumni mentor. That's yeah. all positive momentum pushing us forward. Uh, but the real, you know, big mm, kind of challenge in the room is scale traditionally means you go from thousand to 10,000 to hundred thousand to a million users, right? Hmm. Now, Will there be a possibility of a million person cohort? Chances are nearly zero. Not going to happen. Like very honestly, not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Right? Not even a 10,000 person cohort. I don't think that's going to happen. Right? Like in the entire world, I know people who are doing 10,000 in a single call. And it's people like Tony Robbins. Right? right? It's not, it's not, it's right. not a, <laughs> it's not a nerdy design person like me. It's a charismatic personality who can hold that attention of 10,000 people. Like Tony Robbins, he's got, he stands in this right. huge room with like 360 degree screens all around with like these small zoom windows. And there are 10,000 people on call and he's talking to them. He's individually highlighting them like that. It's not oh, CBC, wow. right? But that is like an extreme <laughs> right. of what is possible. Now, of course, I don't think I have the right. energy to be able to pull that off. And I don't even know if there's that many people who need to or want to learn design, but I don't know about scale. I know I have the positive momentum. I know it'll lead somewhere, but I'm not sure beyond that. Yeah. 
what about doing multiple cohorts uh, in simultaneously yeah. or you know uh, are you are you planning on doing mm. cohorts like like you said your first two cohorts were back to back so are you like doing something which like all the year cohorts mm. or definitely is that in the pipeline definitely. The plan What's the thing is when i think of scale i'm kind of still used to thinking in an academy type terms which is like the startup type terms which is rather than okay. a 2x right. i kind of want to look for a 100x and i'm very tempted to look for one but it <laughs> just right. it just not happening it's not it's not really visible it's not really obvious but yeah definitely what we are doing is trying to see if we can do more cohorts like so far you know the company has been around mm-hmm. for about 2 years we've had a pace of two cohorts per mm-hmm. year now i know that it is possible to kind of pack that in but it'll require a lot right. of like operational excellence like it has to right. run like a well <laughs> it has to run like a ship right everything is well timed you're you're mm-hmm. like you're on the merchant navy right. nothing can fuck up it has to go exactly right right and you have all these waves hitting you and you know anything can go wrong but you got your processes and it goes well <laughs> so that is a very difficult challenge right. um it's one that is still making progress towards but yeah that that is a more straightforward kind of um immediate growth that is possible right okay one more thing is uh, in terms of the demography mm-hmm. right of the batch of 10k designers is like most of them are like students say at the co- university students are like you know post high school 11th and 12th uh and there's like this minority of people who are like working like who are like into 8 years or 10 years of work ex who come into the cohort to learn but you know there is like that disconnect between like say mm-hmm. the vibe of these people and like how they think like has has that been a challenge for you and like uh you know what's your like how is it how's that experience yeah, been for you yeah. to tackle that i think in general just just because most of the people have come through youtube and have kind of found me on youtube mm-hmm. it tends to skew towards a much younger audience um i would say like maybe 30 40% of our per cohort 30 40% of people are from like directly in college like they're in their final year or third year or somewhere in college and then we have another 30 40% who is working right now which is under the five year mark so around one to three years kind of experience and i would say the people beyond that with 5 plus years of experience there's very few of them um firstly because i don't think they spend so much time on youtube as such so they're just less likely to find me mm-hmm. um also i think maybe their model is to generally look for something like a boot camp or something which is a they're looking for something which is a professional development course which this doesn't feel like one right. although it kind of is um once you get mm-hmm. one level deeper so it's a minority i would say and i definitely want people like this around but there is a bit of a disconnect right they maybe don't have as much time and i think in general the general tip is that once you start selling to a more experienced audience like let's say there was somebody who was doing a cohort for managers right for people who manage teams right. or executives at that point they don't want more content they want as less content as possible as distilled as possible right and you know they actually don't want videos they want solutions they want they have a particular scenario and they're like how do i solve um, this rather than you know motivate right. me to get off my ass and you know learn design or apply for an internship like they're past way past that So I don't think Correct. we are really catering to that kind of niche yet. But I mean I have seen a lot of cohorts who do do that really well. Um and you know maybe we right. get there maybe we give it a shot at some point. But it is a very it's a good point you brought mm-hmm. up. It's a very different type of person. Um yeah. Right. Yeah, I think the main reason I bought it up was because when I did the cohort like uh like I I 
finished like my engineering had done like two years of work and i joined it so like say when i was on discord there were all these people who were like first year second years like mm. they were talking about internships and stuff and i was all, like way past all yeah. that and like the second thing is most of them hang out at night like say post 12 mm. it's like you know while you're working you can't be <laughs> awake after 12 you just want to yep, sleep yep. so so yeah that's why yeah. i brought it up i i, I find and uh, i do I find think, that interesting uh, yeah, because it's uh, like in college I, i would assume mba kind of feels like this because you have people from different kind of backgrounds coming together versus engineering is more of a homogenous right. you're all the right. same age um so yeah it gives very interesting right. dynamics yeah yeah and i mean i think one thing that you kind of mentioned about uh, how inflexible people can get once they you know kind of uh, <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't call it inflexible maybe uh, the right term would probably be uh, less explorative mm-hmm. as they get higher in their work structures but pretty interesting now my question is how do you kind of convince these people that design is important and uh, you know um, why do you think there is a lot of emphasis on design today in today's world i think before uh, if you go 5 years back there wasn't as much emphasis on design Uh, why do you think this trend is happening and what do you think we should be doing and kind of telling these higher management people that you know the focus should be here i think the, there's been a few like kind of macro factors that have added to this one of them is just that things are way more competitive today so you have to stand out right a simple example of that would be um in the last couple of years the amount of vc funds that we've seen deployed towards startups is at peak highs mm-hmm. right like barring the so called recession we are in or headed towards <laughs> the amount of capital is yeah. still at an all time high right so which means there are more startups which means there is more competition to kind of stand out which means there is also more competition in the in trying to find the best people because you can now attract them with a lot of money but then we go one step deeper which is like why are there why is why do we have record funding and for india one of those reasons is that the total number of addressable users has been inching upwards right when we look at um just just look at geo for example the the wave of users that is brought on it's mm-hmm. now when you have a lot more users you of course have a lot more solutions that can be built for them a lot more businesses that can be built and these users although you know they're indian users a lot of them coming from maybe smaller cities or even in major cities it's not that they are okay with bad design right like they they have throughout their let's say time with smartphones and for a lot of them smartphones are the first computing device rather than a laptop or a computer like their first app was whatsapp or and then it was facebook and then maybe instagram and then it's google so they are used to a kind of product quality which is global standards like they want it to be as mm-hmm. smooth as whatsapp now whatsapp seems very simple it seems very you know it's a couple of pages but the amount of engineering resources product resources and design resources that go into is removing all that complexity and actually bringing you whatsapp is immense right so there was a time in india like let's say before smartphones where you could get away with kind of bad design because maybe people didn't know what good design was they did not know what it's like to you know use products used made by silicon valley f- with these high functioning teams but then now when they're sta- that's their standard they've used all these amazing apps and you know design for them it's not just does it look good or not it's just they expect a lot like india is a very picky and very choosy market like we want the best products we want all the discounts we can get we want the best delivery on every single mm-hmm. thing and then you know if we don't like it we're going to leave bad reviews like it's a very very competitive market um so i think design then becomes not just you know the visuals and all of this stuff but it becomes how do you create that kind of cohesive experience where you have tech design product for people they might not say it's bad design but they'll say okay the app is lagging or it you know it's uh, too slow or it's not working properly like that to them is 
it's pretty much designed it doesn't work as it's intended mm-hmm. to um mm-hmm. yeah so what according to you is good design i think i would say just two things right to simplify one is does it do what it's supposed to do for the person that is using it mm-hmm. right like with design we often see that there are sometimes there's a sometimes a clash between business interests and user interests right like a user really wants to do something but then youtube is like no i'm going to add a pre roll ad because hey that's our business right like i really want to watch this but no you got to go through a couple of ads first right so there is always that kind of clash so it is that balance of does it do what i expected it to do like if i for example want to get a carpenter in my house the traditional route would be i would get some referrals call my family ask somebody for it or somebody in my street who does it but so much can go wrong so when a platform like urban clap comes and says we're going to actually simplify this they're actually taking on a lot of responsibility to make sure that this guy doesn't scam to make sure that that selection process is smooth the payment process is smooth the you know even for the service provider that they are able to get leads they are able to get their payments on time they are able to you know see the instructions for what needs to happen um urban clap is also creating that kind of incentive system to make sure that you know a lot of these service providers don't just do the bare minimum with no service with no customer service right they are actually creating these incentive systems to also make sure that they are on the top of their game so that they get paid more and they have a better service that they provide right so all of this stuff is complicated to do right because you are really mm-hmm. creating these systems that humans will interact with in the most niche ways possible so design is really useful right. there because it can communicate it can understand it can you know synthesize all this together so i i would say that is good design when it works as it's intended does what it can uh but you know beyond that i also think good design is something that has a point of view which is the kind of person who uses let's say cred versus the kind of person that uses swiggy versus the kind of person that uses share chat right of course right. there are there are a lot of common users between that but the reason they choose to use an app or the re- there is of course brand affiliation that they feel there is also the kind of brand recall which is why should i use zepto um when i can just use swiggy or i can just you know use dunzo so having a point of view a very coherent point of view which kind of gets into brand it kind of gets into perception it gets into what kind of beliefs are you putting out there through all your posts through your product um through the other things that you do in your in your maybe your customer experience such that this person maybe retains such that this person is a loyal user so i think these two things right it's very useful um, and design really really helps these you know you know or let me just say design has the processes tools and methodologies developed over many years to solve exactly this yeah you brought up the point of design can communicate like what a company wants to uh, you know give their users the you know the product or the services so say a country like india where there's like tier 1 city tier 2 city and tier 3 cities where one there's like a ch- difference in how uh, you know which smartphones are used to like the amount of internet availability mm. or like say bandwidth so how challenging does it become for a company and a designer to design products which caters to uh, you know both sides tier 1 yeah. and tier 2 slash tier 3 very challenging very very challenging and i think it's the kind of challenge that hmm. designers in the us or in europe might not fully appreciate or understand because um, like i remember when i was a freelancer when i was just doing you know ios apps for these random f- you know companies in the us these random individuals it was ios so i had to design one screen size it works pretty much you know as right. intended and it's done but the minute you start designing for indian users it's like okay it's android first actually and then you go into your analytics tool and you see okay actually redmi or one of these phones is the most used 
which has its own sets of set of intricacies on how notifications work or how you know how they handle a certain thing um and then you've got the other things that come with android like screen sizes you've got network connectivity like before geo you really had to think about what it's like on 2g 3g and then wifi right certain things can only be done on wifi certain things you know are okay here and you know, very interestingly like i remember there was this thing where facebook had something called 2g tuesdays in their office where they forced the designers and the tech and the product team to actually only use 2g while testing their apps because that's not an experience they've ever had in their life right <laughs> right to actually <laughs> right, use right. something on 2g <laughs> so it's definitely challenging right that all of this stuff is kind of from more from a tech side right the tech phones they use mm-hmm. infrastructure that's available um another challenge kind of comes from the side of mental models which is let's say something like shopping a user in the us knows that amazon has been around since the 2000s um they know that you know i can buy anything online so when you have an app that you know lets you do groceries and you know get it in 15 minutes they're like okay that's what it is i totally understand it but in india when you have somebody who is maybe using this for the first time this is their first device um it's very different because the kind of mental models that they have um you like there was this time for example where you know you probably noticed this with your parents they were very scared to even put their credit card details online right uh because it was the equivalent right. of showing your credit card to somebody on the street to them right? because they're like right. this is no clue right. what happens next if i do that what if something goes wrong and very interestingly that's what we're seeing with web3 as well today right people are kind of scared to get right. in a meta mask yeah. and all this like we've become the boomers now um but, <laughs> but all of these mental models some of these are kind of obvious because we've been through it we've seen our parents and some of these are totally not obvious right which is um it's kind of a new invention or a new kind of world to have somebody who is whose entire livelihood is let's say uber and ola or their main source of leads is urban clap or their main livelihood is deliveries and they do swiggy but they also do dunzo and these other things and these create these new emergent okay. edge cases these new emergent things like what if i'm in traffic and then this and my screen brightness and you know these are things that you have to really on the fly mm-hmm. kind of anticipate come up with run tests to maybe just like visually see this um so it is very challenging right. and i think the Super direction we're also seeing is a lot of these big companies now have indian designers they know that if we really want to go after the indian audience hmm. which is huge right it's they know they can't go after china yeah. but india is right there uh they know that you know there are some things that our designers sitting in the san francisco office just will not be able to do um so that's actually a very positive okay. thing for indian designers as well which is we kind of have mm-hmm. that kind of advantage where there are things that we will be able to do um that you know not everybody yeah. can and it's similar in a lot of it's not just india of course we're seeing the same kind of thing in um a lot of african markets we're seeing this in south american markets we're seeing it mm-hmm. in indonesia for example with gojek and the like yeah correct i think so you sorry go ahead go yeah. ahead sit <laughs> yeah I, i one interesting observation i wanted to make was take upi for example yeah. if you see all the auto drivers they don't use google pay mm. they use phone pay because you can log in through your phone number rather than your email id yeah. <laughs> so i <laughs> think like ob- observations like those yeah. people in the us sitting there won't know uh, about bang it bang on bro bang <laughs> on exactly yeah yeah go ahead so Leo. you yeah so you touched upon how cultural differences um help in you know establishing better product design um at land like said just mentioned uh, phone pay is better suited because mm. it's you know you can directly interact with just your login with your phone number cultural differences is one thing what about um something that's coming up right now which is totally not a human mind at all and i'm talking mm. about ai um ai coming up with uh, you know these really new nascent technologies like dali 2 and gpt 3 
which are really kind of redefining the way uh, things can work and you know uh, might even push the direction of throwing away a lot of uh, freelancers from their jobs um do you see this happening and what do you kind of think is going to be the future when technologies like this can do product design better than humans and do you think still think that cultural differences will like play a role and stuff i think cultural differences will definitely play a role um i kind of see it as technology is kind of this mycelium network this rhizomatic thing which kind of goes into society and finds these nooks and crannies and you know connects them in ways that weren't connected before uh, we haven't seen that too much with ai tools mm-hmm. because there aren't so many of them in the mainstream but we will definitely see that um like we just dali and i saw imagine as well imagine which is google's yeah, equivalent yeah, of it well. which i think will probably hit the market way sooner than uh, dali <laughs> but um, in general with tech if you think about it the main promise has been that we're going to make life so much easier we're going to try to remove inefficiencies we will you know improve productivity in your business and of course that's been through tools like slack you know communication um saas tools um even like for my everyday life like just ordering this from a food delivery app it this is just like acceleration where it's going further and further so like from a design perspective mm mm-hmm. a client would love to have you know a thing and let's just say an agent this could be a human it could be ai and the client says you know aise kuch karte hain you know let's do something where you know there's this panda he's sitting there and he's holding our uh, cup of coffee and you know he loves it or sleepy owl right the coffee brand there are you know what we would love we would love a um we would love an owl sitting in the middle of Connaught Place and you know he's got this coffee around him and then there's just there's just like rainbows flying from the background because that's how good he feels when he does that owl is sleepy and now i'm awake i like briefs like this are very common even today um and nothing wrong with that right this is how um designers would communicate with their ideas this is how a totally non designer would say you know let's do something crazy let's I have this idea I was sitting one day I was imagining why don't you do this for me Now today there is a problem there is that there is a much bigger gap to really bring this out which is the designer would say you know no that's mm-hmm. kind of cheesy we let's not do that that doesn't fit with our brand whatever and let me give you a suggestion for what we can do better or we should so- sort of be doing like that right let me help you with a little bit of that strategy and then let me actually show you these visuals of what we should do now clients would really love they've got dali they've got imagine and the minute they say this brief boom here's here's an owl sitting in canard place you know drinking a cold brew now of course what they do with that that still comes down to strategy right should should sleepy all put that out i don't know right today maybe that's cheesy but in the future where everybody is doing that maybe that is what you have to do to stand out maybe that hyper realism is how you stand out in feeds that are you know just trying to capture yeah. your attention so culturally what will that do very interesting to think about very interesting to actually see how it what happens when slowly slowly these things come out but so in general for the for clients they would love this this is technology doing what it does you know making things better for designers of course this is a bit of a problem if you were somebody whose entire job was just photoshop where you were just the executor who says oh okay this is what the client said let me just do it and give it to you now there's a problem because there's somebody who can do it way better than you for maybe free uh but uh, for somebody who was involved in that strategy for somebody who says you know hey that's not how that's not how the the our average south bombay consumer thinks right this is the kind of aspirations they have these are the beliefs they hold about the products they buy and this is why we should do this that person now literally has a free intern so to say sitting there you've got dali where they can now create all of these iterations much faster and now 
you know, they are able to prove a point much faster. They can say, you know, check this out. This looks like crap. And they can, of course, now charge a lot more because their output has suddenly increased. So it's definitely going to do a lot right. of crazy things to a lot of different people. Um, what exactly it'll do to the individual listening to this? It's really an open question. Right? <laughs> uh, we know the technology is coming. How do we place ourselves? That's a... That's something each individual like really needs to answer for themselves. Yeah. What I kind of repeatedly get from your under like all that you describe about design is the fact that it's not just limited to the visuals and it's not just what can be generated uh, mm -hmm. visually or sonically. It's more about what you kind of understand from your customer, your client and where things fit, how it's supposed to fit. And I think that's what you kind of are hinting mm -hmm. at. Um, what do you, what do you kind of think about designing for yourself, you know, your space your or your personal brand? Um, and I think you are a big proponent of, you know, building a personal brand. So why don't you kind of talk about that? Yeah, for sure. I think one of the things that really excited me about design, even, um, like way back in college was that like a very simple example was I was like, when I know how to use Photoshop, I can create these things and I can put these things out and I can kind of get people to do what I want online. Right. Which is, I post this image, this po image has a call to action and I'm literally moving traffic. Right. I'm from here. I'm getting them to do something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, bro, that's a, that's a fucking crazy superpower. Right. What else can I do with that? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's a very interesting way to look at yeah. it because <laughs> in real life like outside of tech you would have to use your charisma persuasion um, maybe a lot of physical resources to bend the world to do something that you want it to do online it's literally the interface mm -hmm. it's the images it's the videos it's the text it's the captions it's the copy so I was super interested by that um, personal brand, the way I thought about personal brand was, I was like, I definitely, I'm not the best designer. I definitely don't have the biggest audience like now, as well as back then. Um, I definitely don't have the most experience. I've not worked at the best companies, but then maybe that doesn't matter, right? Because if I can, if I just accept that, yes, that's true. And you know, my personal brand is not that every single stat is maxed out. My personal brand is this, this is what my, my version of it is. I could really create perception and perception drives reality in some ways, right? Because it's almost like with personal brands right. today, um, we might meet someone in real life, but they've probably already met our profile on Instagram, right? Like that's not, mm -hmm. that's not metaverse mm -hmm. avatar shit. Like that's reality today. Like our kind of reputation precedes us in the information space at a much faster rate than real life. Right. So I love personal brand kind of stuff. I, um, I'm not really that heavy on it. Like, you know, like maybe Gary V or, um, like a hardcore content creator, but I do know that it's very useful to my business. Like one example of this, I can give in the CBC YouTube design kind of context is I, from the very beginning did try to do long form videos on YouTube, right? Where I'm, it's not perfect. It's right. not the catchiest, but it's long form. You're seeing me stumble a little bit. I'm talking. And then I was like, okay, let me change my background. Let me put some posters about design. Let me talk more about it. Let me actually dress up a little nicely on videos. And once I start doing that, I know that, I know that long form, I mean, this is just the way I think about it. I think long form builds authenticity because you can't, fake right. being anything but yourself for an hour and you know over multiple times so right. when people see that display of authenticity which is kind of rare it kind of builds trust and once people build trust they're like yeah i am i'm gonna pay a thousand dollars to this random guy who's just starting out compared to you know a boot camp that's been around for 10 years and is probably much better in terms of their operations and everything but i trust this person and they mm -hmm. kind of, you know, I kind of relate to this person a lot more. Um, 
so I think Persephone is really interesting for, you know, anybody who's kind of trying to do something online. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really enjoy applying design process to like random things um, in whatever capacity possible. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think continuing Super on personal branding, uh, you also talk a lot about mental models. I think <laughs> even in this podcast, you've mentioned mel- mm. mental models like repeatedly. And you have a lot of videos on like mental models to, you know, create your own career or like in personal life also, right? So like, what is your first instance of, you know, coming across mental models and you were like, oh, wow, like I, I you know, need to create mental m- models around everything. Yeah. Um. I would say, I mean, rather than mental models, like one step simplify is just beliefs, Mm -hmm. right? That's one way I mostly think about it. More often than mental models, I think in terms of beliefs. Um, Right. But yeah, I I use the word mental models because, I don't know, people somehow connect with that better. It kind of sounds cooler and beliefs is just like, (laughs) hey, like, what what, what do you mean by that? my first right. instance was maybe in college itself, maybe before that as well, but I wasn't really, I, I don't know. I wasn't really doing work as such, so I didn't register. But in college, I realized that belief will drive what I do. So my belief was that the only available option I had was um, placements after college. Because I, I really didn't know anybody who did anything else. Right. and the people who everybody else looked up to were the people who had gone through and had worked at these companies through placements. So that was my belief in the world. And then as a result, the way I operated was, oh, fuck, okay, shit, like I got to get my GPA up because that's literally a limiting factor. Um, You need to get above eight if you want to even apply or interview at these things. And so then I tried doing that and it didn't work. And I really, really tried and it didn't work. Like first semester, second semester, bad GPA, really bad GPA. So then I was like, I'm kind of faced with a conundrum, which is my belief tells me that I'm going to fail. But then my action tells me I really literally, I'm still not able to figure it out. So that's when, you know, that kind of pressure and I realized, okay, actually the belief can be changed, right? Which is I, as I saw people were freelancing, I found out what Odesk or today Upwork was, I saw a couple of friends of mine who were also doing freelancing online, who were making money. Um, I was like, okay, the, so maybe a more useful belief for me is that yeah, placements are there, but I can also make money online doing random stuff. And then I heard about startups and stuff back then. So I was like, okay, so that's another thing that's possible. And so then the real belief became, okay, can I, do I think I can do that? Like, do I think I can make money online or do I think I can only do placements? Right. So I think beliefs drive everything we do. Okay. Like if we believe something is too difficult, we won't do it. Even if in reality, it's not that difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, so then I try to think about beliefs in, for, pers- for my personal life, I th- try to think more in terms of beliefs. When it comes to design, it's, it is literally more mental models. Like the mental model for Web3, people don't expect money to be stored in a Chrome extension, right? MetaMask. Like that's a mental model they don't have. But over time, it's a mental model that will become the default for most of the world. And it's already a default. A lot of people already do that today. So design is almost like how do you accelerate or how do you bring adoption to these ways of thinking? Yeah. Right. Got it. So another thing, I think like uh, Lou and me, like both of us, we've done the traditional part of education. Mm-hmm. Right? We've been engineers, we've worked for a couple of years and then we are doing our masters again. So it's like, you know, the general path, which most of them take. Uh, as for you, like, you know, after your job, you've worked on like a lot of side projects, now 10K designers. There's this obviously topic of uh, financial instability, mm-hmm. right? So say as a freelancer or as a person who's starting their own business, how do you tackle that? And like, how do you uh, make sure that you have that stability so that you can keep moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I'll be very honest. I've struggled with this a lot in the sense that, um, when things get stable and I know money is coming in, I have this urge to fuck things up, 
which is I'm like, you know, you know let's take the more riskier option now. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it has caused in the past, right. you know, I'll build up my savings and then I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm actually comfortable with this. Let's take some risks. Let's do some crazy shit. And I, and, and the bank balance goes back to zero then. And I'm like, oh, fuck, dude, why did I do that? Um, so <laughs> it is something that I, you know, right. I, I'm not the best at. Um, and you know that it's even worse right. when you can just spend thousands of dollars on through Ethereum on NFTs and shit like that. Um, right. <laughs> uh, that's terrible, bro. But uh, I think in terms of financial stability, it's I just think in terms of um, I need there's doing new things, which is, I think interests me a lot more than doing the same thing over and over. Right. But doing new things comes with more risk mm -hmm. and more likely that it takes time to figure right. out how to make money doing that. So like getting now, mm -hmm. let's say if I were to go say, I want to get into web three completely do NFTs or something like that. I know it'll take me a long time to figure out how to make money in that um, and how to get to a stable point. But uh, I think the right. outside of a salary, right, which has helped me a lot in the past to just get back on track, have a predictable cash flow. I think it's about finding things that you can do repeatedly that make money. And that is kind of like for cash flow. That's for um, iteration. That's for really to build discipline, to be honest, because it's always easy to go after the shiny new thing. So I think for me, building right. discipline is doing the same thing with small changes, but I know it's pretty much guaranteed to make me at least this amount. And it was the same through freelance. I mm -hmm. knew that I could predictably make at least this much if I put in some amount of work. Right. But then for me, it is a kind of battle between doing the predictable thing or going after the volatile, shiny mm -hmm. thing like that. Mm -hmm. So, and this kind of breaks my discipline usually. Because, you know, I just go all in and I can't cope and then whatever. So it's a balance. I don't know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Since we're in the topic of finance and I mean, the mention of MetaMask quite, so, quite yeah. a few times in this podcast, you are uh, an NFT collector. So um, I want to know more yeah. about that. So, uh, yeah, what got you into it in the first place? Um, uh, I, like you said, right, we, we are the new boomers. I am one of them. <laughs> I, I just cannot wrap my head around, you know, how we can probably, uh, you know, pay money for, a, for an image, yeah. for a JPEG. You know, I still think of it in that terms, but though, though I do understand it's a lot more than that. Uh, so, yeah, what got you interested in Web3? What made you an NFT collector? Yeah. Um, firstly, you know what? I've actually taken the choice to not talk about web three on my main channel and all this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly because of the discipline thing, right? Which is, I know I have this design thing going on and I know that mine's and my, I, this thing is to fuck it up by just going after the shiny thing. So for discipline purposes, I'm like, I'm not going to talk about web three on my thing, but in general, <laughs> I think for me, what got me into it was that it was just new possibilities are now open. Right. So in a similar way to back when there was a time when most designers like UI UX designers wasn't really a common thing. It was more of you're a web designer. Why? Because the main thing you designed right. was websites. Apps weren't really a thing. And this was not even that far back. It's like a little bit before 2010, for example, right? Designers were web designers or they were UX designers, which is like this thing. There was no product designer or UI UX designer. But then when smartphones came out, you're like, oh, okay, I can do things with location, right? So it's like, oh, okay, if location is another Lego block that is now unlocked and now I, I know designing, I know I can make this, but I can also use location as one of the things in the stuff that I make that unlocks a lot of stuff. And eventually we got to a point where camera phones became normal. And it's like, oh, okay, I can now use camera inputs for whatever in whatever scenario. And now that's like a new building block that I can use in many ways. And you know, businesses have been built on this. Like, um, you had to call for a cab. Now you have location and Uber recognizes that okay. spots that before everybody else and, you know, builds that. 
Now, of course, I'm not at that level where I'm going to build a huge business on one of these trends or things that I spot. But as a designer, it's definitely useful to me. So when I saw Web3, my kind of first reaction was, oh, okay, like money can be coded into the system or value can be coded into the system outside of Razorpay, Stripe, banks, right? Which is a photo, a picture in my app can actually be owned by somebody. Now this unlocks, of course, new types of mental models, like, okay, what does that mean exactly for everybody? It unlocks new business possibilities, like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. like, can we build a marketplace around this? Can we, you know, do other things? It also unlocks cultural possibilities, like, oh, okay, what happens if somebody says my profile picture is worth more than yours? Um, and then what happens to, all the stuff that we thought was default, normal, or the way things are. But now the way things are is not looking the same anymore. Right? So that was what got me into Web3. And, right. you know, I haven't really designed too many Web3 apps by myself. I'm more a bit of an observer, mm -hmm. um, kind of helping through mostly the design perspective. But um, I think it's interesting. Right. Yeah. But how has your journey been in terms of like NFT collection? Because yeah. recently, like I bought one NFT, I bought a WeFriends NFT yeah. and like, I am still looking out for the possibilities. Mm. So like, what was your first NFT? And like, from there, mm. like, how did you be like, okay, I have to collect more NFTs and how do you evaluate yeah. projects? I'm sorry, I'm laughing because uh, you guys are talking about buying NFTs and here I am who just bought an LIC IPO. <laughs> <laughs> <Lots of things. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I mean, I wish I had more of the financial discipline to invest in safe stuff. But with NFTs, kind yeah. of what happened for me was I, of course, had a little bit of ETH that I had bought before. Um, with NFTs, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, wait, I can actually spend this ETH to do something with it. Like I can buy something with it. And so very quickly, I just spent all my ETH on right. JPEGs. And I was like, oh, fuck, why the fuck did I do that? Like, I, I've been slowly <laughs> building this crypto kind of portfolio, not in the very serious way, Bank. just like every <laughs> yeah. once in a while, buy a couple right. thousand, whatever. I'm like, should I just spend all my, like in my entire bank balance? Um, but then with NFTs, I saw that you know, there is value. For me, NFTs kind of reminded me of Pokemon a lot, which is as a, right. <laughs> as a kid, mm -hmm. you don't really have a bank balance, right? You can't really accumulate assets or anything. <laughs> like you can't flex with what you Correct. own and your parents own all that shit. Like you don't own anything. But then with Pokemon, suddenly you're like, right. oh wait, I do have a portfolio of sorts. And you know, there is value there where you can say that I know that this card, <laughs> I know that other people want this card. So then as a kid, you start thinking about all these possibilities. You're like, oh, fuck, like, you know, like, what can I do with this? And so when I saw NFTs, I was like, fuck, this is like, it's tapping into some kind of weird pathway in my brain that I'd forgotten about. Um, and then, you know, of course, it's also like sneaker flipping in some ways which I, I don't really do, but I'm kind of aware right. of that culture that kind of exists out there. Mm -hmm. So that is what it was for me. And then I kind of spent an unhealthy amount of money just getting more ETH because I needed to <laughs> buy more JPEGs. Um, and, you know, I just right. lucky, bro. It's just luck. Some of those kind of worked out. Mm -hmm. um, but, right. but, you know, now... And then it, it was kind of a negative thing as well for me because it really, really distracted me and um, took me off path from right. my main business um, to the point where I took a Correct. six month break. I was like, dude, I need to do this. It didn't work out. Negative spirals, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, let's build this back. Um, but yeah, I think it's right. still very, very early. We don't really know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. There will be a time when, you know, it, like like how m mobile is mainstream today, like everybody has it. It's pretty much the main platform when you think about designing products. Um, people did not think that was possible. Right. Right? Web designers back in the day looked at mobile as a small, like small design. They they were like, dude, like 
web design is the shit mm-hmm. dashboards that's what real design is mobile yeah. design you're making a small version of that you're making the light version of that right people that that is how the culture was um <laughs> right today maybe we are seeing that kind of same cultural battle with web 2 web 3 but you know i personally right i i try not to take sides i'm just going to try to focus on my thing Um, observe yeah. observe right. understand no but I, i feel you have taken a side yeah <laughs> i feel you have yeah, taken yeah, a why side do you think so? given the fact that you are also an given the fact that you're also an angel investor to a company called avalon meta mm. which is in the meta space so i want to know your your thought your thought process or the analysis that you kind of do before investing in companies mm. and what made you kind of invest in these you know uh, web3 companies so i think you have taken a side that's yeah. right yeah okay <laughs> little bit i agree um <laughs> i would say with like evaluating an nft project is very similar to me um similar to evaluating and let's say an angel investment which is you are looking for momentum right which is with nfts you know the floor price today is this thing and it's going to be that tomorrow it is nfts are way more liquid angel investments are not right angel investments you can probably exit only at the next round or whenever somebody else buys your art with nfts you can buy at 1.2 sell literally in the next hour at 1.5 way more liquid market but it's it's still momentum investing which is I know that there are certain narratives attached to this project. I know that the team has certain plans. I know that mm-hmm. there's a community around this. And I know that given the current momentum, this is how it can go. It's sort of like you're spotting a trend or a cultural thing early. And design somehow really helped me with this, right? Just understanding stuff because I was doing this kind right. sim- something similar with um just like regular product design. but uh, angel investments i think i i'm not really a angel investor in any professional way i just kind of put money in my friend startups like it's literally that so havelon meta the founder varun he was my um he was a he was in my same college we also went to iit coaching together briefly and neither of us really it didn't really work for either of us there but uh, <laughs> in college him and i as well as a couple others we actually started freelancing together so all of that stuff and he actually taught me design like he knew photoshop and he taught me how to use photoshop and i was and i was very thankful for that because till then i only had all these ideas all this talk but i couldn't really make anything so for me it was just like a personal thing okay. but i think what meta what avalon meta is doing is very interesting they are building like a community platform um and i definitely help them every now and then with more like design stuff but you know outside of that i don't really angel invest so much yeah right so speaking about community platforms right like so now 10k designers is a community mm-hmm. and where web3 is going towards is like community building decentralization but like communities building uh, building on what they believe in Ooh. so like if you see most of the 10k intro videos and all that it looks like it's like it's going to be a community in the metaverse mm. is that the direction you want 10k to go towards mm. i mean i thought i did and so when i took the break i was like you know let's <laughs> make a pivot into web3 right. somehow um but i feel like mm-hmm. for me at this point it's still quite early um but i definitely you know the good point you brought up there's definitely a lot of similarities which is i mean said you've been through the cohort so you know that right like that kind of experience where people come together with a shared purpose and they build these relationships and right. they get value kind of similar to an nft project where people come together they have this kind of shared purpose yeah. communication and the value they have is like literally their portfolio and you know they can coordinate and do things exactly uh but i think that's probably not I don't see that like as a strength that I have anymore. Although I know I could probably mm-hmm. there are common things that I could apply across. I think in general that's the nature of right. things we're headed towards, which is most startups mm-hmm. they have a big cost of user acquisition, 
which is spending on ads. That's a huge chunk of Correct. all money that they raise goes to Facebook or Google or whatever. I think community is just taking the kind of brand building, the kind of perception stuff that you would do, but trying to just align it with different incentives, okay. right? In a more web two kind of model, they would be purely customers. Right. They would be purely customers and Correct. they don't really, like the investors that you have that kind of hold your stock, let's say, versus your customers were these two different right. groups. Right. And the products you launch are for mm -hmm. this group, which is the users. But then the business Correct. momentum you do is for this group. It's for investors. Versus with NFT projects, we're saying these are pretty much the same group now. They are your users and they Correct. are your investors. Even in startups, we're kind of seeing that with the rise of a lot more angel investors, a lot more like crowdfund type mm -hmm. of models. So I think in general, we are Correct. moving towards a more like community as a very important thing in business. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that what that invites is, you know, don't just be a user where you are this passive consumer, become a co-creator with us. Our value goes up, your value goes up. And now the time you spend all this attention online, you actually get value out of it, whether it's through money, it's through assets, through, mm -hmm. you know, other rewards. Yeah. Okay. Right. So where do you think this entire, I mean, Indian startup ecosystem or the world's ecosystem of startups, uh, given that you have mentioned that this is the new wave that's coming in, what is the direction you think India's market is going to take uh, in the next 10 years? I think I, I have no clue from a very, I, I mean, I don't have a very solid clue. It could go any direction, but I think what I'm excited about using, using one of your <laughs> mental models. Yeah. What I'm excited about is just, you know, <laughs> we have momentum. Momentum is the main thing that I look at when I want to like predict something or should I get in? Should I go behind this? Like even when I started design, I knew there was a lot of momentum towards design becoming an important thing that people will care about a lot more than today. Right. So from a momentum perspective, I think the, the new users that Geo has brought on in the last couple of years, like that powerful momentum keeps moving forward, right? I don't think that's over. I think we're still in like the middle of it, right? So that will continue to play out. Um, I think with Web3, I would be curious to see where, how this kind of makes it to the mainstream. Like I know on Twitter, it kind of feels like profile picture NFTs are kind of mainstream, but it's very small compared to like, let's say the whole world. But one thing that I am very confident about is design will continue to be an important part of all this, which is even if you have to convince people to, you know, switch their current behaviors into a more web three way, or if you have to get people to adopt smartphones for things that they're not doing today. Like today, for example, we've got two companies like Hatha Book who are creating these tools for Indian mm -hmm. SMBs to literally manage their entire Khata, like their account right. registers and all that. Right. That is something that was not possible. And I don't think they would have Indian merchants would have been very comfortable with that pre geo. Right. But now they're like, okay, what else? Can we get loans? Can we, you know, do this? Can we do that? So very exciting to see where that goes. There's going to be new use cases, new products. And I think design will definitely play a big role in that. Yeah. I'd like us to end with this optimistic note. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Sir, if you have anything else, go ahead and shoot. Yeah, I think the last point I want to make is, as Abhinav said, he runs two cohorts a year and he just opened up his cohort five for design. So anyone who's listening and is interested in design, please go check it out. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, uh, I mean, we didn't cover these things, uh, but he has a brilliant book called Pyjama Profit. Uh, you should probably go and read that as well. Um, and thank you so much, Abhinav, yes. for... Uh, being a part Absolutely, of this podcast, guys. a lot of, lot of interesting things. Um, brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant episode. Thank you so much once thank again. You, yes. Thank yeah. you guys for the amazing um, conversation. And I guess um, I just have. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, 
I just have one last thing to say. Uh, friends are your real angel investors, guys. So go <laughs> find them. Uh, I'm Lou, <laughs> and I'm Sid, and we are Lucid. <laughs> <laughs>